this networking event, uh, how to network more effectively with Gene Evans. We have attendees from all over the world, including Australia, the US, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Italy, and the UK. Also a warm welcome to all our Irish attendees. I know we're all looking forward to potentially traveling inter-county come the 10th of May. So that's what we have to look forward to. Um, on behalf of Stephen Mullen, the president of the union, who is also here this morning, I'd also like to remind past pupils about the Rock Union or Rock Around the World event on the 3rd of July. Please try and support this event either by walking, running, canoeing or swimming um, for 5K. You can also donate to the charity on the day. Um, I'd also like to remind people about the Rock Union website, which has been renewed and refreshed by Richard Burke. Um, so please try to make sure that your personal details are up to date and try to connect with classmates through that website. Also try to spread the word about, you know, set, making sure that people join the website because it's a great collaborative way of keeping in touch with people. Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Stephen Mullen, Richard Burke, Frank Keane, Bridget, Bridget O'Byrne and Alison Perry for making this event happen. And also a big thank you to Jean Evans for being here today to to tell us all about how to network more effectively. I know I can learn a few things as well. Uh, the format today will be questions and answers, first of all with Jean, and then Jean will give us a couple of tips on how to network more effectively. And then lastly, there'll be questions and answers or questions from yourselves. So if you have a question, just stick it in the chat box and hopefully we'll get to it at the end. Now for our speaker today. Jean Evans is an expert networker. She's the founder of Network Me. She's the president of Network Ireland. She's a speaker, facilitator, coach, mentor, and introvert. She helps business owners, startups, and ambitious professionals network successfully with the confidence to reach their goals. So thank you for being here today, Jean. Sorry, are you on mute? I can hear you now, sorry. Okay, that was strange, didn't change anything. Um, the wonders of, of modern technology, but lovely to be here and thank you for the invitation, Owen. Delighted. Great stuff. So um, tell me about your career history and why you're so passionate about networking, Jean. Okay, so the short version is I worked for 22 years in tourism. So I, I had started uh, teaching English in Turin. I had lived in Italy for many years. And then I had been on the IBEC program, the European Orientation Program with IBEC. And I was already living in Italy at the time, got a job in what was Board Falcha at the time, or also known as the Irish Tourist Board. Um, I was supposed to stay there for a year, uh, got a, an extension, got another role. Um, and after six years in Italy, and we were head over Greece and Malta and Cyprus, I decided I want to move. And I was going to go to Spain, work in a bar, learn Spanish. And two jobs came up in New York. One was the same as the one I was doing. Another one was in business tourism. So I said, right, let's, let's go for that. So I went for the interview and was like, forget it, great. And if not, off to, off to Spain to learn Spanish. So I got the job in New York. Um, and I popped over to Ireland and back to Ireland to process my visa. I moved out to New York, but also in the five, six weeks I was... In Ireland, I happened to get together uh, with um, my now ex-husband, um, slightly more than I thought I was going to be sharing, but um, that we got together, which was some amazing timing, and I was living over there, he was travelling, I was travelling, and then I got headhunted back to Ireland, so we had a house here, so the man house job was all over in Ireland, so back 2004, logged my way back to Ireland, and um, I've been here ever since. So I ran the Convention Bureau in Dublin for five years and then I moved on and I moved to an international company called MCI. So I was a professional conference organizer for 10 years. And I then, and I was very much, and I just put it in perspective, I was very much a career professional. I was in career, I was in corporate, this is what I did and who I was. Um, and I'll explain why I feel that's important to differentiate, but 
I got made redundant then on the back of my third child. So I had been running a big team. I ran a big department for the professional conference organizing department. And I worked with associations. I used to do the international bidding. So people can imagine the, the process for bidding for the Olympics for niche topics, whatever it is for uh, pediatric surgeons or cow veterinar veterinarians, whatever it is, there's an association. And I would do the bidding for the conferences to come to Ireland, to the convention center or to the RDS or to hotels or what have you. So I would bid. Dublin against other European or international cities or Ireland as a country against other destinations, other countries. So I did an awful lot of this. I had an awful lot of presenting and again, I'll, I'll tell you why that's all relevant. But I then got made redundant. So my team, I had left a team of 26 people. I had been signed off from maternity leave and what have you. And I, all my team was disbanded basically when I was on maternity leave. So obviously they could legally tell me, but the writing was on the wall so I didn't have a team to manage going back so got my papers and if anybody has ever been in that situation of being made redundant it's, it's not the greatest moment in your life you know because there's a whole sort of oh my god what am I going to do now what are my skills um really come to Jesus and also because I thought I was going to be in this industry and tourism whatever aspect of it for life I loved it um, so it was really, oh my God, who am I? What do I do? What are my core pillars? And I sort of went sales, marketing, management, that's sort of my experience. And I then started working with my other half. So just to put that in perspective, I was still feeding my youngest and I had two other toddlers running around as well. So I was very tired, probably quite hormonal and emotional as well on top of all of this. So it just wasn't fantastic timing. But I then started working with my other half who has his own business in uh, managed print. So I had to learn a whole new industry and asset financing and sort of going into sales that side of things was fine and doing marketing, uh, but going into a small company from a large company that brings its own particular dynamic. Um, I, what I realized was that I didn't know anybody. I was really well networked within my industry, within tourism, internationally speaking, because all of our meetings would have been abroad. I had well um, connected community within Ireland when I stepped out of my niche sector, I didn't know anybody. And it was a big realization for me. So I was well networked, but at the time in corporate, I didn't know I was networking. I didn't know it was a thing. And I, I was saying to somebody the other day, I wish I had met me 20 years ago because I would have taken on the world if I had known what I know now. And we, a lot of us can say that because it's 2020 vision in hindsight, but there's lots of small pieces of information I wish I had had because it would have made me a better person, a better manager, a better employee, better everything at the time. So was it um, the setbacks that actually made you identify the, the fact that you need a bit better network to, to pull you through more difficult times? When I started working um, in Brian's company, um, I, I started, I, I joined one of the chambers I started getting into it, hadn't got a clue what I was doing, um, didn't know how to talk to people, really engage. I was trying to both learn an industry and develop new contacts that I could nurture and build relationships with to, to work on sales. Um, and I remember thinking that, right, I'm going to join a few networks. I'm going to see where I'm getting business and then I'm going to call and I'm going to work on the ones that are getting me business. And that I literally remember thinking that. And then I joined um, some female only networks. Um, I just have to put one caveat in there. You said I was president of Network Ireland. Uh, maybe in the future, I'm Network Ireland president for Wicklow rather than national. So there's, the, there's, there's 14 branches. So um, I don't want to steal our, our national president's thunder there. But I joined all of these networks. And by so 2018 and 19, I was probably involved about eight or nine different networks. And I loved it. And when I reflected back, I went, okay, here's what I, you know, some of the things that I think are really important and whether you're employed or a business owner, why I think these things are important. I had to find my voice. And what I was saying was when I was presenting Ireland against other destinations, I could get in, uh, on, a, uh, on a stage in front of an auditorium of thousands of people and deliver a presentation because it's about deliverability and content and the, the passion you have in delivering your, 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 what you need to say. And people say, you know, you're, oh, you're very confident to be able to do that. I was and I wasn't. I knew what I was talking about and I was confident in my ability to deliver, but I didn't believe in me. And what next could, could, I, could I ask you a question on that? Yeah. yeah go for so it. like I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and 
you certainly don't come across like you're an introvert, but I was surprised to see that you part, put that part of your, um, put that on your profile. So you, earlier on in your career, would you have described yourself as an introvert or are you still an introvert or how do you, yeah, yeah. How do you overcome being such a good networker, being an introvert in the first place? Yeah, so I, so the short answer is no, I didn't know. I knew I struggled and I would say I spent 20 years of my life thinking I wasn't good enough. I felt less than. And so people would conflate what they saw on the outside of me being able to get on a stage in an auditorium and deliver a presentation with you must be uber confident. But they didn't see what was going on in here or in my heart and my soul. And it's only in the last year or two I've really got to understand what being an introvert means. And the more I understood about it, I went, oh my Lord, I wish I had known this all my life. Because all of those feelings of self-doubt, of feeling I wasn't good enough, I was less than, and all of my own judgments in my own head going, why don't I fit in? Why don't I feel I fit in? When I understood what being an introvert meant, I went, oh, okay, I'm just not built that way. I'm not supposed to be like that. So the way I describe it to people, and I have a, a couple of slides for, for afterwards, but the way I describe it to people, if it was a, a toss up between going to a party and having a glass of wine, sitting with a good book, you'll find me with the glass of wine and the good book, because I do not want to be in the midst and in the fray of everything. I'm not a party animal, it's not my thing, don't want to do it. And I am better if I was out in, and I suppose the, the, the I don't want the, the word, the irony of all of this, working in the events and conference industry, there is loads of entertaining, there is loads of gala dinners and events and stuff where you're supposed to be out and on all of the time. And I did it because I had to, but I also struggled and I was exhausted and I didn't know why. I knew I was exhausted, I knew I was struggling, but I didn't know why until I started learning what it meant to be an introvert. Um, so what I would say about being an introvert is that an introvert is about your energy and how you process information. And I, if something happens to me, I'm the person who's going to have a really intelligent response about two days later in the shower because I've had time to process it. I won't be that instantaneous, off the cuff, super witty, super funny type of person. I will have a response a couple of days later because I've mulled on it. And I think, and I, me, myself, and I have so many conversations, but everything is in my head and I just need to be in my own space, my own bubble. And that's part of it, but it's about your understanding your energy. And then people say, well, you couldn't network if you're an introvert. I'm going, I, I'll put another layer on it as well. I'm also, I've moved myself from pathologically shy, is the way I would describe it, to Shy. Shyness is not something that goes away because shyness is social anxiety and being an introvert is around your energy source. So I am a shy introvert and there's lots of different categories. You can also have shy extroverts. So it's the lesson I've learned out of this side of things is it's really important to understand you, to understand your energy and to understand what your triggers are. Because once you start raising that self-awareness, you can do something about it. So one of the figures that would get me and why I think this is super important is 50% of the world. So we've got 7.4 billion there, thereabouts people in the world. Around 50% of the world is introverts and most of them don't know it. And most of them think there's something wrong with them because the world, school, work environment is set up for extroverts. And you, you, you mentioned um, what I was talking to during the week that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama are both introverts and yeah. probably the best Absolutely. speakers. Yeah, and in terms of like, there's, there's loads of people that are introverts, you know, so Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Darwin, Einstein, um, Barack Obama, Clinton, uh, they're all, uh, Beyonce is, is, as an introvert, but it's around understanding your energy source. And it was one of the things I just, I haven't seen all of the comments, but somebody's just said, um, Greg, I think you put it in, uh, lockdown showed me that I'm an extrovert because I like being around people more than I thought. I love being around people, just not all the time. And that's the difference. I could not be around people all the time. And I've got three kids, love them to bits. I don't need to see them all the time. I just can't, I can't because I have to mind my energy. And that's one of the things that learning, being an introvert, what I learned is one, to identify it. When I understood it, it made me far more confident because I realized I'm okay because just this is just the way I'm built. 
and that's okay, but also understanding the positives of what being an introvert means. Um, excellent listening skills, excellent observation skills, excellent attention to detail, and I could go on and on, but all of these core skills are actually excellent in the workplace, but also the people, and this is something for, for employers that I would say is that if you've got teams, try and understand what energy your teams have, because introverts need to go away and process information. So they need to have space where they can be away from people so they can process information. But that's also where you unlock innovation. So if innovation is important for your company and you've got open plan office. So for example, when I was managing a team of 26, I was in the corner of an open plan office. So I just had a merry-go-round of people coming at me. So now match that back to somebody who needs to be able to go away and have space to recharge I didn't have that and that's why I was exhausted because I had no recharge time and introverts need recharge time. Extroverts don't. Extroverts get their energy from people. So there, there's the slide. I have a slide and I have sort of an image on it. In my I'll, 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 that, that. That's, I'll ask you a, a couple of more questions before we go into your slides. Um, so tell me about the importance of giving, you know, in your network. Um, I actually met you first at a BNI event there last year uh, mm -hmm. through a mutual connection and BNI, for people that don't know what BNI is, it's a business net network international where their motto is givers gain. So why is it so important when you're networking, Jean, um, to, to be a giver um, to start off with anyway? Or why so, is that important in, from your perspective? Yeah, networking is predicated on, on three words. It's the no like and trust factor and you have to get to know people you have to learn whether you like them or not and you have to build up that trust and part of that is building up your social capital where you're looking out for ways to help people to enrich them to support them to be a champion to people within your community so I was doing I was talking to somebody this morning we were chatting about the concept of networking and we talked like it, it's it's about building a community of supporters and champions but you can only have supporters and champions if you become the supporter and the champion for other people and you learn to give and you build up your social capital and think about it like a, a bank account where you're giving and making contributions and making lodgements. But you have to build that up because you cannot meet somebody and then just have an immediate ask without having built up the relationship. So, no, you know, we people and, and men and women network differently and I'm going to point this out as well because obviously we're in a, an, an audience of men. Men want to go straight to the bottom line, women want to build up the relationship and will create narratives and stories and stuff like that. So for men it's to have a bit more patience with women as they do that because it's part of building up the relationship and the way they do it. But women also need to be aware that men want you to get to the bottom line quicker and they're just some of the dynamics. But I think that there, there's um. I could go on on the, on the gender discussion of, of, of networking, but it's about giving and a giver's gains because it's creating that good karma, if you like. And when you've helped people and helping people can come in so many different fashions. Like I, I find um, when I say this, it's a sweeping statement. So be, be gentle on the, the chat. Um, men say, I'm going into the network and it's all about the sale. And I would say straight at you, it's not about the sale. That will be an end game, but if you can't nurture and create your process and go on a networking journey, and what I would say is like, back to when I started networking out in what I would call the, the business professional world, I had to find my voice. What does that mean? And what do I mean by that is, I now didn't have a large infrastructure. I didn't have this title. I didn't have this company, all of these supports around me. It was me going out. And what I realized was that was far more vulnerable, far more vulnerable for me to put me out in the world, not behind a, a company and behind a business title and behind a bid that I was doing for somebody. This was about me and my values and my beliefs. So it's really important to understand who you are, what you believe in, what you will unapologetically be unequivocal about, you know, whether it's diversity, equality, all these different things, but what makes you tick what matters to you and that's a really really core in being a good networker because if you don't understand you you can't understand how people will align to you if you don't know what you stand for so that's something really key but okay. again what I look back on it just grew my confidence because my sense and my self-awareness grew exponentially and then when I reflected back on that I thought wow 
we all have to grow personally. We have to grow, go on that journey. You won't grow professionally, whether you're employed or a business owner or trying to manage a team or whatever, unless you know you and you are growing and self-developing. And that's what networking does that. Yes, sales comes at the end of it, but it's a journey and it's enriching and it's rewarding. It's also fun. It, you meet awesome people. So, you know, if you, you know, one of the things we chatted on the preamble to this, if you haven't met each other, start making inroads to meet each other. If you're here and you want to be networking, you're part of this union, connect with each other, work out how you can connect, start with LinkedIn, you know, I'll have a couple of tips on that as well, but connect in, don't worry about age gaps. That's something that people really get flummoxed on. If I'm only only just out of college, can I connect with somebody who's six years of age? If I'm 60, can I connect with somebody who's 22? Why not? You both have something to learn from each other. So take the fear out of it. And what I would say is remember that it's one human being to another human being. So if you need to break it down that much, just remember they're another human being who probably have all of the same anxieties about networking and connecting as you do. So you, you brought up a lot of good points. I like the, the social capital, you know, of, you know, improving your social capital, but also growing yourself by networking and by being surrounding yourself with, with really positive uh, people, you can actually grow yourself. Um, how would you, since it's all moving on online or it's moved online and, and it'll probably be a combination of offline and online network and networking mm -hmm. in the future, how, how would you suggest nurturing your online network? So obviously you mentioned LinkedIn and, you know, it's a lot, I find it a lot more difficult, you know, to nurture an online network or, you know, how, how do you get to know people online? How, how, how do you go about networking online? Obviously you can connect, you can connect with people on LinkedIn by sending them an invite, but... <laughs> okay, so here's, what, I'll tell you what I do. And, you know... When I meet, and I, I suppose I have a few aspects to this, but when I when I meet people, I make sure to connect with them. And I always put in a message to say why I'm connecting where we met. And I'll, I'll reiterate that uh, shortly with the slides. But I always connect with people. And then I build up the relationship where I am interacting with them. So it might be that it's a happy birthday or they've changed job or they've got a promotion or something. And I will connect in, I will put up a bespoke message. So LinkedIn does all of the automated messaging, whereas it's thanks or whatever. But I will always go beyond that and make it bespoke where I'm actually putting a bit of effort and time and a bit of me into saying, hey, I see you. And networking is about seeing people and, and literally going, I see you, I'm thinking about you. I want to give you a bit of my positive energy. So that probably sounds a little bit fluffy, but that's really what you're doing. And it is that 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 those layers of things. The other thing I do, and I it it, it fascinates me where people don't use LinkedIn enough. They don't profile themselves enough in order for people to be able to build up a relationship with them. So one of the things I would say is look at your profile. If your profile is written in the third person, start writing it in the first person and think about questions. What do you want people to know about you? Are you approachable and are you relatable? A lot of people write their LinkedIn like a resume and it's a list, but that's underselling and, and, and doing a disservice. So put effort into your LinkedIn profile and give a little bit more of yourself. Um, they would say that there's less than 1% of people who on, on 740 million LinkedIn users, less than 1% actually post content. Nine engage, you know, with commenting, but 92% um, of, of people are what are called lurkers, where they stand and watch. Standing <laughs> watching doesn't mean anything. It means you're not engaging. So the first thing is start engaging, comment on things, support people that you know, support by commenting, engaging, tagging. It's all of these soft things, but it builds and it builds. And people will recognize and remember if you've engaged and supported their content. It's also, you can put content out into the world. And that's part of going back to what's your voice? What do you stand for? What are your opinions? And are you ready to put yourself out there by using content, whether it's posts or articles or stuff like that? That can be unnerving when you do it at the start, believe me. The first time I did it, I was like, Right. Um, I literally, I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but my heart was in my my hands. And what I realised after was there was no solar eclipse. The world was still turning, and I went back to my email and said, "Right, what's next?" 
And it got easier over time, but there was that moment of apprehension. Oh my God, I'm putting some of me into the world and this is my opinion. And what do people react? And oh my God, and the evaluation and judgment. And I have to get over myself. And that's part of the journey you go on to get over yourself and to realize that your voice matters to other people in the world. It's how you serve other people in the world. And that's how you make yourself relatable but also making things a little bit personal. So are you into particular sport? Are you, you know, list these things out in your profile in terms of I'm um, in cycling or road racing or kayaking, whatever it is, but put something out there that tells people more about who you are and what makes you tick. Um, so try to make it a bit more personal rather than, oh, yeah. all right business. Right in the first person. Yeah. yeah, right in the first person. I think we should probably kick off with your presentation anyway, Jean. So I'll let you... Um, Perfect. Put up your screen. Yeah. Corset has decided to disappear on me, so bear with me one tick. Yeah. We did this test two seconds ago and it was all there and that was all wonderful. And now that I want it, it decides to, to go. But um, I think we're there now. Yes, we are. Good stuff. The wonders of technology. Super. Okay. So the first thing I would say to everybody is networking is about future proofing yourself. So if you're going to put it, if you've got post-its or a note or you're writing something down, just write future proof. I do a lot of chairing and facilitating of different networks. And one thing that I find is that people come into a network because they've got an immediate problem to solve, be it sales or something like that. Networking will not work for you because it is a long-term investment in you or your company or your career and if you got made redundant like I was or you decided you want to pivot and change industry or you decided you want to retire but you want to set up a consultancy if you're retiring at 65 and you then say wait I'm going to hope I'm going to open up a business but I don't actually have a network this is where you need to future proof you need to be thinking in advance like my hand's going out of the screen, you need to be thinking in advance of where your future will be and start plotting about who you need to have in your network, where they network and how you're going to get connected in with them and who can introduce you. And that is how you're going to start future-proofing yourself. So you've got to be strategic about who you need in your world and in your community. So that's the first thing. So this is my little image to talk about sort of introverts and extroverts. So you can see with the introvert, it's about everything is happening in the head and it's very internal and it's internalizing information, it's processing information. So it's taking things in from different sources and then going away to process. And this is why I think it has a big impact. Um, introverts are by nature, because of their skill sets and the things that I mentioned earlier, introverts are phenomenal networks because they're phenomenal at building relationships. So the way I look at it going from, I'm, from my experience in thinking I wasn't good enough because I was struggling to actually understanding and owning the fact that I'm an introvert and that's why I say it because this conversation needs to increase is that being an introvert is my superpower so if you haven't found out whether you're an introvert go do a test you can there's free online tests go and find out because it's empowering and it's liberating and then you're going to have an aha moment you're going to accept it and if you're an introvert I want you to put on a little imaginary cape and the next time you walk into a meeting, you're going to have your imaginary superhero cape on and you're going to go, it's going to make you more confident, it's going to make your shoulders go back and you're going to feel more at peace with yourself rather than having these voices of doubt. But you can see with the extrovert, all of the information is being pushed out because extroverts get the information or get their energy from people. They need to be around people. This can be quite intimidating from a networking point of view. So what we would term or what we would have grown up knowing is the, the social butterflies and they're the experts who want to flit and, and talk to loads of people and that's fantastic but they're actually not getting to know people they're not getting to know um people in detail to understand what makes them tick what matters to them and this is where our introverts excel they excel where they're in small groups or one-on-one -on -one where they can really get to know people and have deeper conversations and not just top line small talk conversations so again it's understanding more of that it absolutely is liberating it's empowering and it's confidence driving if you get to understand that because you will have so many aha moments so for a lot of introverts in the workplace the way it has happened is they've had to learn and 
a few more extrovert personalities and and personality traits. So one of the things is there, there's a group then that has sort of been termed the ambivert. So this, you, you'll see this afterwards. So the extrovert enjoys spending time with others. Introvert wants to be on the own. Introvert likes to process information internally, externally. So you can see the different the differences there. So I'm not going to go through all of it, but the basic is they're quite opposites, but they both have their value sets and they both bring different values to um, organizations, to teams and stuff like that. And it, for me, Again, I wish I had known this a long time ago because it would have made a lot more sense and made me far more comfortable in my own skin. And that's one of the things, the learnings I had. And when you're comfortable in your own skin, you're better at networking because you're not constantly doubting yourself. And that's why I think it's really powerful. But also as a manager, I think it matters because you can be a better manager. I always had a, you know, a very, very strong sense of integrity managing teams and stuff like that and always doing the right thing by them. But doing the right thing by them also meant doing the right thing by me. I just didn't know how. And that's why I think it's really important that if you are an introverted manager, call it, say it, and just say, sometimes I'm going to need to go away and learn how to manage it because you will get the respect from other people in your team. But also if others are introverts, they're going to say, I actually get it. And you will have a better environment. So I think it's extremely powerful to, to learn and understand more of this. So networking 101 preparation, 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 preparation. So I like to say to people, have a default diary. Default when you're going to do your preparation. Default when you're going to go to networks. And the, the key to networking is consistency. It's about showing up. It's about engaging. So being a part of different networks. Um, at a minimum, I would say to people, you need to be part of two or three networks. So if you're an accountant or an engineer uh, and you're based in Ireland, as an example, you might be in Engineers Ireland or the Chartered Institute of Accountants or what have you. And that's fine for peer networking, CPD. But here's the thing, there's a real world and there's a big bad world out there. So you need to be networking from pe with people from all different backgrounds and walks of life to start lateralizing, broadening how you're thinking, but also for your business knowledge. And what you learn through networking is phenomenal. It's, it literally is game changing. So put the deep, put the meetings that you're going to do and attend, you know, if you're part of a BNI or, you know, whatever networks you're a part of, make sure that's in your default diary and you have your prep time for doing your 60 seconds or your elevator pitch, what have you. But also, and where a lot of people fall down is the follow-up. So default the time you're going to use for following up on your networking meetings, because if you've said you're going to do something, you need to go and do it and um, because your reputation lies on this and I think this is you know for me networking is all about building up your reputation so again think about what how do I want to be known how do I want people to talk about me in terms of my own personal brand how do I want people to talk about me when I'm not in the room so do what you say you're going to do and if there's going to be a delay um you know with COVID and everything things are difficult so what I say to people is I'm going to get that done ASAP I have it written down I will get to it sometimes I know exactly when I'm going to get something Something. Other times I say, I'm not sure when I'm going to get to this, but it will get done and I will keep you posted. So you can manage people's expectations that way, but follow up is key. And if you default it into your diary, that people, and why I say that is a lot of people will say that I don't have time to network and I would always respond every single time. You don't have time not to network because it's time to work on your business, to meet other people. Um, and there's so many other th things that will come out of it, but you don't have time not to network. But where people struggle is if they're trying to insert a networking meeting on top of a full diary. Whereas I say, start with a blank diary, put your networking stuff in, and then build all of your other appointments around it, because then you know you can make it happen and it becomes sacrosanct. Think of it as an integral part of your sales and marketing process. It isn't sales marketing and networking. Networking is your ability to sell. It is your ability to market you, your brand, your business, what you do, the problems you solve. So it is a part of it. Don't think of it as another add-on. And it's about reframing sometimes. And um, it's fostering and nurturing the new relationships that you have and are building with people. You're building that trust. And when I said the no like and uh, trust factor, it's it's a stand, it's a, it's a testament to your integrity and it's the opportunity to give, which is what we started the, the, the meeting on. And I suppose the giver's gain is based on the law of reciprocity, that if you give to other people, they'll want to give back to you. So how do you engender that? You People will not want to give to you if you've never given to them or given out to the universe. So it's that's what the whole pro, the, the, the thing of giver's gain is. 
So building the right type of network, again, being strategic, what does that look like? So there's people on the call today. You know, I always suggest when I'm on calls for people to share their LinkedIn URL in the chat and save the chat after a meeting, because then you can go and connect with people afterwards and say, hey, I was on this call as well, and um, I'd like to connect in with you. You start building up your network. I would always advise people if they're starting with LinkedIn to start with about 10 minutes a day and build up where you're connecting with people, you're messaging and you're nurturing your network. But stand back and say, right, am I connecting with my colleagues? They're not always going to be your colleagues. People have chapters in their lives. So you might be working beside somebody and think, sure, why would I need to be connected? They're sitting right there. But they're not always going to be sitting there or you're not always going to be sitting there. So make sure you're connected in with all of your colleagues, the people you meet at meetings, your suppliers, your stakeholders. Who else could you be connected with? Because that's how you're going to start building up your relationships. And the thing with LinkedIn, what I always say to people, LinkedIn is your professional profile. It goes with you and is part of your journey in life. So if people want to connect in with you and are in your community, that's how they're going to find you. So it's worth optimizing it and making it very real and relatable and, and approachable. So it's just to say, you know, think larger about how you engage with it. Um, I would always say to people put in, you know, just little tips as well, always personalize your invites. So for example, you can see the top right graphic there, invite Darren, always tell people, hi, Darren, I'm connected with you because I met you on the Black Rock um, uh, webinar, da, 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 and love to connect with you. Would it be a good time to have a cup of coffee or a Zoom meeting or stuff like that and have a call to action and sign off with your name. That's you starting to build up relationships. But why I say that is, I'm sure you've all been in this um, uh, where that has happened to everybody is that somebody goes, oh, I see you're connected to Owen Wilson on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, I don't know him, don't know why I'm connected to him. Uh, yeah, don't, can't help you there, can't connect you in. And we've all got people in our networks where we don't know why. And that's why I say personalize your invite because that starts that journey of you connecting in. So even if you didn't connect in with somebody for another year, you would be able to go back to your messages because it's archived and go, oh yeah, I know where I met that person. And you continue building the relationship rather than starting from scratch. Um, ask people why they're connecting with you. If they've connected and they haven't put a message in, I would all say, hey, how, how can I help you? Um, you know, why are you connecting? And tell me a little bit more so I can start a conversation with them. But as I said, you know, in terms of your profile, what do you want people to know? What do you want to convey about yourself? And that's really important to understand. The power of one is how you are going to build up your network. Um, if you're a part of three networks, I'd say do one, one-to-one -one with a different person from each of your networks each week. And that is how you are going to create that compound factor. So for me, networking is like compound factor on, it's got like compound interest on your pension. It only works for time. So you've got to be systematic and process driven in how you build up your network and how you invest in it because of the no like and trust factor because how long after all does it take to build up trust with somebody one it takes as long as it takes and um, the length of time it takes depends on how invested or how engaged you have been with those people and um, you can't say that if you do two one-to-ones with a person in a year that you know them you don't you know top line information so how how are you going to invest and engage and I think another thing, a lot of people will say, oh, I'm just about on LinkedIn, don't do a lot with it. Don't underestimate using other social media profiles because people put different information on, you know, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and what you see and learn tells you an awful lot about people because LinkedIn is the biggest professional networking and um, business networking um, and social website out there. But people put a lot more professional, or sorry, personal and whimsical information out there on different channels and it tells you a lot about them whether it's their family their interests their passions it tells you lots of things about them so if you want to build up a storyboard in your head about somebody using social media is a really good way of sort of finding that information that they don't realize they're even telling you but you want to know about the person, what they like, that you understand their business and that you're learning over time how to help them. So I would always say to people, you need to say, how can I help you? And I, I was in a one-to-one -one there recently where somebody said, we got on the meeting, goes, how can I help you? And I was like, okay, how can I help you is a philosophy, it's a mindset. And 
in order to be able to answer how can I help you, you have to get to know the person and they have to get to know you. You have to learn how you align. You have to learn whether you like each other and whether you want to do business because if you refer somebody in, they have to be a good representation of you. So you have to learn about the person and before you, you're not going to be able to help them until you learn about them. So this is where doing your one to ones and connecting with people. And this can be done. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for companies developing internal networking policies where they're getting their teams networking together. It's going to work for diversity, inclusion, team morale, remote working, especially for people who are starting in companies and haven't actually got to meet their colleagues physically. Setting up a, a way to enable and create this environment where it's good to network with each other and that there is no hierarchy on the networking, that it doesn't matter whether the receptionist says, I'd like to do one-to-one -one with the CEO. That is a mentality. It's a growth mindset. And opening up that for businesses, I think, could be game-changing. It's not something that I've come across, but the more I know and the more I've learned from the last few years, oh, my Lord, I wish, as I said, I wish I had known me 20 years ago because I think this it's game changing for what it can do for companies in terms of confidence and reducing churn and increasing team morale. There, there's so many different aspects, but just it's a win, 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 win for everybody when people feel, feel, feel comfortable. So just finishing up then, what you want to know is, are you bringing value? So again, that's another posted thing. Are you bringing value? And value and what that means to the person you're with or meeting is going to change depending on who you're who you're with because value means something different to everybody depending on the chapter of where they're at in their life. It could be that they want you to follow them on social media or follow their, their business profiles. It could be that they want to be interviewed on a podcast. It could be that they want um, to write a blog and have a guest blog. It can be so many different things. So don't, don't pigeonhole it. Think about it laterally because what people need and want is different. But understand the value that you can bring to other people because that's where you're building up your sport and your champions. So this was me yesterday. I ate my frog. I had one of those mental blocks in doing um, newsletters. So I ate my frog yesterday and got my first newsletter out. So I just want to say if anybody would like to sign up to it, that is the URL to sign up. And it's going to be a weekly newsletter where I will give tips. Um, so the way I've signed, uh, scheduled it is that there's one article which is sort of informative and educational. So yesterday I put in how to give when you've only started networking as an example, and then I profile a network as well, because I think a lot of people, one of the values of you know Owen, what you were talking about hybrid networking and networking on Zoom is that it's business beyond borders now. It's, it's the ability to go to lots of different networks and connect with people all around the country or all around the globe, which is fantastic. So don't think, think wider about where and how you can network because sometimes it's when you pop into a meeting and you make a new connection and there's serendipity and it can be so many different things, but you will always learn. And with each networking meeting, you should always have aha moments. Always you should have aha moments. And you won't necessarily have thought about it like that, but look out for your aha moments raise your awareness and thinking I learned something new or that's I need to go back to the office and bring that back to the office or I need to connect this person or I can help this person or god I've known this person for a year but the way they explained what they do today that just there's something resonated they use a different word and it suddenly creates a trigger and dot joins dot something sometimes that's what it what it requires so what I want to do is help people network more confidently to understand where they can network what's going to be suitable for them because it is very much horses for courses depending whether people are B2C or B2B but networking is for everybody so what I'd say is if you are I suppose I'm a voracious learner and I like to learn I like to meet people I like to know and the more I know the less I sorry the more I learn the less I know that's what it feels like but I just meet so many awesome people sometimes I don't know how I can help them today but maybe in two years time, I might come across an opportunity. But if I've built that relationship with them, I'll know to connect them in. But what I always say to people is make sure you've done your one-to-ones before referring people in. Because again, you have to know why and how you're going to connect them in. So they are my contact details. That's my blog, um, Networking Gene, where I write on all things weird and wonderful to do with networking. And it literally is people's questions or uh, an observation I've had, you know, and the one I did there on giving, that was literally, I thought, oh my God, you know, B&I goes, give us gain. And people say, give, 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 give. And I was going, what if you only started networking and you're going, you've no idea how to give. And you're sort of going, I don't know anybody, so I don't know how to give. So I thought, let me write something about that. So that's what I did. And there was 10 tips on giving 
that is not exhaustive, but it's to give you an idea of you can think laterally about how this works and grow. The last thing I'll leave you with is networking is a skill and it is, you're not born with it. Nobody is good at it at the start. Nobody is good at networking at the start. It's a skill. It can be daunting and panicking and overwhelming and all of that. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. We all have this thing about these perceived things that we're going to be judged and all of that going on in our head. But it's manageable once you start growing your skills of networking, growing how you connect, growing how you learn to help other people and you shift your mindset and reframe it a little bit. And please believe me that learning to network is game changing. It is confidence driving. It is superb for teams. And yeah, please get networking. If you haven't started, biggest tip, start. Thank, thanks a million, Jean, for your presentation. Um, if, if people want to get in touch with you, you're, you, you obviously provide um, mentoring for networking and strategic advice for individuals and companies so they can, they can reach out to you. What, what is your, what's the best email address or if, if people want to get in touch with you, Jean? Yeah, so it's Jean at networkinggene.ie. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. So you'll find me everywhere, generally under Networking Gene or Network Me. So please do connect in and I post lots of different bits and pieces and random thoughts that I come across and people's questions and I try to answer them. So yeah, I do mentoring. Um, I do LinkedIn training where people want to just get their, their profiles up to date and just really understand how to get the essence of them out into the universe. Um, and it's just, it's, it's training people on networking as well. As I said, like it's a skill and it's, we didn't, you know, for any of us that drive, and I presume most of us do, you didn't get into the car and know how to drive. You have to build up your skills. And then when you got it and you got your license, you got quicker, better, faster, and more confident. And networking is the same thing. You will learn and you will fall and you will learn a bit more and you will fall. But each time you're raising your awareness of what works, what doesn't work about how you're articulating. But if you need presentation skill experience, if you need to learn and um, to be, you know, get more clarity um, on, on your communication skills, if you need time out to get different perspectives, uh, and work on your business because you can't just work in your business you have to work on your business networking allows you that time to be out and, and processing different information just gives you space to think but also to learn and connect and I think there's so many you know for a lot of businesses in Ireland we have so many SMEs but you know with tenders as an example you know tenders under 25,000 in in Ireland and part of the EU protocols is that they encourage small businesses to connect and do joint tenders together for as an example so if you were into social media and somebody was a website designer and somebody else's copywriter why couldn't you come together and answer a pitch together but the people you're going to connect with you're going to know them through net networking because you're going to know it's it, you know the ability to show up and be consistent and engage it speaks to your reputation. Do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you show up? Do you engage? Do you do your one-to-ones? Do you follow a process? Are you a good colleague within a networking environment? Or are you the opposite where you don't show up and you never answer and you're, you flit in and out and stuff like that? So networking speaks so much to reputation. So I started a blog there on why people should choose their suppliers from networks because it allows you to watch and social proof your decisions and networking allows you to social proof yourself to say, I'm a good supplier to work with because I'm a reliable, engage, I show up, I am going to be a good representation of you. And I think that's actually a very, very powerful way of connecting businesses. So um, I'm just looking at the, the, the questions. Um, there aren't too many questions. You've obviously covered all the bases, Jean. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, please, free to send them through before the presentation ends. Um, but Rory asked, are there any specific introvert, extrovert test websites you'd recommend? Oh, so there's one, God, I think there's one, um, I did one recently, it was just sort of a random thing. I, I was looking at different ones. Um, so there, there's ones where you can do the psychometric ones, you know, the Myers-Briggs and the DISC and stuff like that. And that tells you about your personality type. But there was a free one, I think it's called 16 Personalities. I'm going to say, 
I think it's, our, I think it's called 16 personalities, but it'll ask you lots of weird and wonderful questions and you'll, you'll sort of go, oh. but then there's other ones where you go, oh, that's so me. You know, so that there's that, those times where you're sort of going, I actually just need energy and I need to not talk to anybody. And the phone is ringing, you look at it going, yeah, can't answer that, I'll talk to them tomorrow. And it's all those moments that you don't think are anything, but they are everything actually, when you, you, you start understanding who you are. And as I said, learning about your energy. And I think this is another thing that I hear is that a lot of shy people, extroverts love going out and talking to people. For them, it's not an issue. But introverts or shy people think, I'm too shy, I can't network. And, or I'm an introvert, I can't network. So I want to really, really copper fasten this. You're going to be excellent at networking. What you need to do is learn to manage your energy, to understand your energy, to understand your triggers. And a lot of people, I would chair meetings in person and obviously online now for the last 14 months, but people say, well, there's no way you're shy or an introvert. You go into the room, you can chair it. I'm going, nope, I can, because when I get into the room, I can turn on my A game, but you didn't see what it took me to get into the room. And that's where minding your energy matters because then it's psyching yourself up or just knowing that you're going to be doing this and managing your energy before and after that you're not talking to other people after so it's all of these triggers that you'll start hearing and listening to them and then you sort of go okay that's why that's happening but the thing about it is it's okay and you are okay and that is something that is really really important because that is one of those moments where I went oh I wish somebody had told me this a long long time ago because I would have done a lot less self-doubting than I did and I would have been freer and more confident. And, you know, it just impacts on everything. There's, there's another good, two more good questions there. Um, so uh, someone's asking, so how do you manage a, a long list of over a thousand contacts? Is there an ideal number of, that you should be working around? So I suppose keeping in touch with a thousand contacts is, is quite difficult, but maybe you can answer that question, Jean, how, how best to network with a big contact list. So statistically, they, statistically, you can nurture and keep in contact on a more intentional level with 250 people within a year. So you're not going, so the answer is you're not going to connect with a thousand people on a day-to-day -day basis or what have you, but you can keep a network of 250 alive through the year. So that, that's a statistical average. The, on LinkedIn, the organic reach, and I don't think anybody in Ireland is going to reach this necessarily, but the organic reach of LinkedIn is 30,000. So at 1,000, you're okay. The way you're going to connect with your audience is about how you engage with the content, whether you're putting in comments. And what I say to people is don't bother liking because the algorithms in LinkedIn, it does nothing. The value is in you commenting, tagging people, sharing an article. That's the interaction, that's the engagement piece. But if you put content out there, your own content, yeah. then the content should be based on you saying, this is what I'm an expert in, this is what I'm a subject matter expert in, this is where I have expertise, and you put your opinion and your voice out into the world, that's how you'll engage with the other thousand. But when you put content out there, LinkedIn works on the basis of the algorithm that it wants to connect with people who are within your circle, but also where it thinks the information is going to be useful. And how that, so it only actually sends your information out to about 5% of your audience. But where it starts opening, if you think about an onion, where it starts opening those layers is the more engagement there is from other people who say, yes, I think that's interesting, or I'm going to share that on. Then it says, oh, this must be interesting. I'm going to open it up. The algorithm opens it up to wider bands of people. So there's a process around LinkedIn. But so it's not that a thousand people are going to see your content or anything, but it, you have to build it up and build it up and build it up. And this is where, if you are putting content out there, you're going to want people to engage. If you want people to engage, be ready to engage back on other people's content. But that's a very short answer. Um, another good question. So does Jean have any tips on overcoming imposter syndrome? I think everyone struggles with that to a certain extent. But anyway, off you go, Jean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that would be a section in itself. I'm actually, I'm actually in the middle of reading a book on imposter syndrome, and it's super interesting. So there's one thing that I did, we hear about imposter syndrome a lot, but the one thing that I didn't realize that there's imposter feelings and imposter syndrome and what the difference is. And they say 70%, but really it's probably much, much higher of people will suffer from it. But imposter syndrome is something that is perpetual and it's all of the time where you, 
defeat yourself subconsciously saying that you're not good enough, that uh, you were lucky, you were just in the right time, the right, time, the right place at the right time, met the right person, whatever, and you constantly delete all of the evidence of why you got something. But an imposter feeling is where you get that promotion or you step out and you get a new client and you have that doubt in that sort of moment, but it's not perpetual. So, and you can move yourself on, but basically the basis of the book is, and there's lots of different types. There's, well, there's five different personality types around imposter syndrome, but, um, and it all shows up in different ways. And I guarantee that every person on this call has done it. So it can show up as procrastination, overcommitment, lack of drive, saying, I'm not gonna to put too much effort into it because I don't think I'm doing, I'm going to do very well. So with all of these different things, and we all do it, all of us do it, and we see it in our children and everything else, we all do it. It's all imposter feelings or imposter syndrome, and that it's how it manifests itself. So people just don't realize that, and I think that's another fascinating um, topic, but the, the short way of dealing with it, it's not, you have to move the dial. The first thing is to become far more aware of it, and understand the triggers and understand the voices going on in your head. So the two things, simple things you can do is when you hear those voices, write what they're saying down and then see, is it actually true or is it not true? Because the fact of what you're doing, whether you're excelling in your career or your business or you're making the sales or you're managing your team well, if the facts are the facts, the facts don't lie. Okay, so you have to focus on the facts. But by Some people give their imposter syndrome a name. So a bit like your dog. So you go, Sam, you know what? I need you to off today. And you can write it down and say, not true. I don't believe you. And you have to sort of train your subconscious. So that, that is a whole topic in itself, but it's fascinating. It does show up in all of us. Um, and it's to be aware of how it can show up. The more aware you're uh, of how it's impacting on you, the more, I think, forgiving you are of other people when you see it in them. But also when you see people... Mm, let's say honouring, it's not the right word, uh, they're, they're imposter syndrome to say you're better than that, you know, give people the support and, you know, be their champion. So Ken, Just another, we'll, 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 we'll finish off with, with this question, Jane. Um, can you, sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, so uh, someone asked about how how direct can you be when you're looking for a new job? Um, you know, if you're if you're networking to to try to find a new job, it, it's, it's probably a, quite a good question. But um, I guess it's trying to balance out being trying not being too too direct, but also you have to be mindful of the fact that you want to get a new job, so you might need to reach out to your network. So exactly, it's another, exactly. another good question. This is where uh, there's that, uh, Ken has put a good question in as well. So, um, I so in terms of career, again, this is future proofing yourself and working out where you want to be. Where do you want to be? Do you know where you want to be? Um, I, you know, when I was working in tourism, I would have networked within tourism and I didn't network outside it because I didn't know it was a thing. So, my first thing is network widely and go out you know whether it's into chambers or whatever be a part of different organizations where you can get different experiences but if you can work out where you would like to be and you've got a particular company and role you need to start going into your network going who knows this person or who's the person i need to connect with is it hr or is it in r d or whatever identify that person then start working through your networking and having conversations who knows this person and can they make an introduction and the value of referrals be it for a piece of business or for a job, is that the person has done the social proofing for you. They have warmed it up and it's not cold. And that has untold value rather than being just sending in a CV. So you can short circuit this scattergun, throw mud at the wall um, type of approach by being very, very particular and precise about how you go after jobs but use your network but you can only use a network that you've built and that's why back to my first slide you have to future proof yourself you have to think further along the line what do I want to achieve is it a promotion is it setting up my own business is it a side hustle whatever it is and who needs to be a part of my network so I would always work on the basis that there's different ways of doing it but what I would always say to people is you need to have four people in your network so one of them you need to have mentors everybody needs mentors and one thing i having lived abroad for a long time 
in Ireland, we can be a little bit cynical. We can be a little bit sure I'm not going to pay somebody to do something. And when there's only talking, it's only about the hedge or a cup of tea and it'd be grand. Actually, no, you need to pay or engage with people who can give you professional advice in areas that you don't have that expertise. And when you have mentors and coaches, you won't always need them. You won't always need the same people, but you need to have your mentors. So work out in any given year what skills you want to improve and find people who could mentor you into them. Sometimes that could be paid, not paid. But mentorship can also be listening to podcasts and people who are experts in it. So it doesn't have to be, it can be from afar as well. So just again, think about it differently. We all need coaches. Um, you know, whether you're, I'm sure a lot of you are into golf and Tiger Woods and, and Phil Mickelson, they all have their coaches. Why do they have their coaches? Because they can't see their own swings. And it's the same thing in business. You cannot see what you're doing right or wrong in business. You cannot make yourself accountable or see the wood from the trees without somebody external to you saying this is what you're doing or here's where you could improve or why don't we try this we all need coaches to make us better and I think in Ireland that's something that we really need to change our mindset and reframe it in terms of getting coaches the third person you need in your network are connectors so you need to know who the connectors are in your network because they can connect you into people you want to be connected and you know I, I would class myself as a connector because I know a lot of people and once I get to know them, then I can sort of say, right, I keep them, I have a digital Rolodex and I can sort of say, this person needs to talk to this person and I will connect them on email and say, this is why I'm connecting you and I want you two to have a conversation and, you know, I'll go on like that. But the fourth point is your, if you're in business or even if you're a salesperson, I think for sales, it can be quite difficult for a lot of people. They, uh, a business owner can say, I'm hiring a salesperson and I want that person to go out networking, but the business owner doesn't know how to network, therefore they don't know how to manage and understand the KPIs to set it against the salesperson, then you have a lot of people who become disenfranchised and disillusioned about the process because neither of them knows how to make it happen and how to be successful in networking. And having, if understanding who your referral partners and who your customer sources are, you know, I think a lot of people go out into networking and think, I need to find my end customers. I'm going, no, you need to talk and find the people who talk to your customers before you do and build relationships with them. So now you're bringing it down from everybody to a few people and you're going to nurture those relationships. So for example, just to give you um, an example, I was talking to somebody yesterday in a, on a mentoring session and she's in health and safety. And I said, right, you know, you need to mind map who is going to talk to the customers before you do or who could be a referral partner. And I said, okay, well, first one that springs to mind for me is a solicitor. And she didn't think about it. And I was like, well, because they're dealing with all of the claims from lack of compliance or slips in the workplace or something in construction, find the solicitors who deal with this type of thing, build up relationships with them because if the company then wants to increase or um, improve its systems and you have built up the relationship with them, you become that natural referral partner for them. So don't try and find all of your end customers, try and be savvy and efficient and strategic about how you are building up your relationships. Okay, I think I think we'll we'll stop there with the questions. Um, unfor unfortunately, um, it's we'll have to come to an end. But Jean, thank you very much for for your time and your <clears throat> and your knowledge. Um, I I definitely learned quite a few things. You know, the power of one to ones, the power of your you know doing what you say, doing what you say you're going to do, um, future proofing your network, um, even tips on how to use LinkedIn more effectively and uh, yeah, reaching out to people you don't know and trying to build up warm relationships with them. And what else did I learn? Oh yeah, networking with people that have the same interests and, and trying to be a bit more personal on LinkedIn. Uh, so, so very insightful, Jean, and thanks a million uh, for your time and, and your energy. We can clearly <laughs> see you're very passionate about networking. So, um, as I said, if, if anyone wants to reach out to Jean, please do so. She, she's kindly given her time today to, to help support the union. So we really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thanks a million.